What role do works play in our salvation? If we are saved by faith, and we are, it is our profession of faith in Christ that saves us, nothing else. By faith alone are we saved. However, the question then is going to be, well, are we just saved by faith and there's no works after that? Well, our works do not save us. Let's make that abundantly clear. We are not saved by what we do, and we are not kept saved by what we do. The question then is, how do we know that we are saved? And for what purpose are we saved? Are we just saved just to uh, litter the field with our good faith, but even our bad works are being shown? Or are we here to show our faith by our works? And so what I want to do is point back to the very beginning. It's always been for God that we ought to have faith in him and then to obey him. Well, how do you obey God? Well, you obey God in what you do, what you say, what you do, how you act, how you think. And think about when God is speaking to Cain, going back to Genesis uh, chapter four, and Cain is supposed to bring an offering to the Lord. And so it came about in those days that Cain brought an offering to the Lord, but his offering was not regarded the same way that his brother Abel was. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but not for Cain. Then the Lord said to Cain, verse six, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And so the point is that if you don't do well, then what's waiting there for you? Sin. In other words, you are showing your approval or in this case, your faith by what you do. Here we've got Abel, who the Bible credits Abel's faith as being something worthy to be shown in Hebrews 11 but not Cain's. And so what was Cain's issue? His faith. How was it shown? By what he did or what he did not do. And so you cannot say that you have faith in God, that you love the Lord, but then there's nothing that happens. Now, let's be clear. It's not up to me to investigate, to see your level of faith being exemplified by your work. I can't always tell. As a matter of fact, I might make the wrong assessment. I might see you doing something and then say, that person can't be saved. There's no way that you're saved and you do this, or there's no way that you're saved and you don't do this. That's why Paul says, let every man examine himself, not that you should examine someone else. Now, can we see something that someone else is doing and point that out? Sure, we're part of the same body. And so just like I see something wrong with my foot or my hand or my elbow or another part of my body, I will notice it and I will take the necessary steps to help that part of the body because we are part of the same body. But I can't make an accurate diagnosis like the Lord can to say this person is saved. He's not. His actions are the actions of an unsafe person or vice versa. Nor can they do the same thing with me because they don't know what's happening intimately, internally. There might be a struggle that they simply cannot see. There might be some victories internally and externally that they cannot see. But clearly the Bible is clear in telling us that God wants us to have faith and then that faith will be followed by, exhibited by our obedience, which is in what we do. In Exodus 36, the Bible tells us what God is going to do with the hearts of man. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. Moreover, here it is. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And then look at this word here, cause you to walk in what? In my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And so the point that he's making, I'll give you my spirit, put my spirit in you. And what will happen will cause you to walk in my statutes, in my teachings, what I've commanded you to do, what I want you to do, to obey. The spirit is to cause you now. How perfectly, how straight? Obviously, not perfectly, Obviously, uh, not at 100 percent, because we are still going to be uh, humans in our flesh. There are going to be the desires. And so what we're doing constantly, we're fighting these desires. We are. And here's the good part about it. When we do fail, there are other people that are struggling in that same area that will see us. And as they see us, what will they do? They'll see that this person is just like me, but his focus is towards the Lord. So it helps to even in our failures, helps to gather people and bring people to the Lord. Jesus makes a statement. If we don't think that our works are important, he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. No, no. Some might say no, that they may hear your profession of faith. That they may hear your faith. No, in this case, really see your faith, that they may see your good works. And the word here is air guy, which is clearly works what you do and glorify your father who is in heaven. So people will see your works, what you are doing 
and that will be the catalyst to push them towards God. Obviously, uh, your profession of faith, them knowing that you're doing this for the Lord is going to be the reason why they go to the Lord, uh, seeing your good works. And then you speaking about Muhammad or Buddha, that's not, that's not going to work. But it is your faith that brings about these works. You trust the Lord. And so you obey the Lord. As a matter of fact, you obey the Lord because you want to. What's happened internally is eventually going to make its way on the outside. You cannot tell me that something has changed on the inside and nothing on the outside is ever affected. You can tell what's happening inside of a house by many cases looking at what's happening outside of the house. And so in this case, we ought to be exhibiting something. How much? There's no measurement. I can't tell you how much you ought to be doing or anything like that. But the goal is there has to be something that we're doing tangible for the benefit of one ourselves, but also for the benefit of others. Now, there's something that is brought up in in James. And James might be a cause of confusion. Remember, we are not saved because of um, works. But we're saved because of our faith. But how do we know that we have true faith? Well, James broaches this question. He says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith, but he has no works? And the same word that's used there is er erga for works. Can that faith save him? Can that faith? And the word that's used there is hey, which is the, can the faith of that person, is that the kind of faith that saves him? The, the, obviously, the obvious implied answer is going to be no. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in, and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Really, truth be told, kind of harkening back to what Jesus says, what use are you? You are useless. You're good for nothing. Someone's in need, and, and then you offer nothing or even desire to offer nothing. He says, even so, faith, if it has no work, is dead being of itself. Now, if you say you love the Lord, but you don't love your brethren, you don't love the Lord, according to 1 John. There's no way that you can say, I love the Lord and love no one else. And if you love someone else, what will you do? You'll do something at some point in time. Something about your love for another person is going to come out. How often? He doesn't tell us. We're not told that we've got to do this, this, and this at this time and that time, this many times, this frequency to show that you love this. We're not told that. But a lack of love for someone else indicates a lack of love for God. And if you don't love them and you don't love the Lord, you are not saved, indicating there's nothing transformative that, that has happened inside of you. Look what he says, verse 18. But someone may say, well, may well say, uh, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, my works don't indicate that I'm saved, but if I am saved, I should have something to go along with that one that I can see. Remember when the the uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, and so forth, they came out to see John as he's baptizing, and he called them brood of vipers. What fruits of repentance do you bring? There needs to there there should be some sort of fruit, some sort of tangible evidence internally. Again, everyone can always see it, but you know who can tell if you've got some fruit? You can. Obviously, the Lord can but you can. And so when things that grieve the Lord don't grieve you, the things that bother him don't bother you, the things that uh, hurt him or, or dishonor him don't do the same for you. Houston, I think we have a problem. He says, you believe that God is one. Okay, fine. You believe. You do well. Uh, even the demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless. Now, he points to Abraham. He's saying that Abraham is justified by his works. No, but because of his faith, Abraham moved. Abraham obeyed. Things occurred based on Abraham's faith. And so, yes, there is a level of works that are that we should be involved in because, again, God is using us to bring people into the camp. The only way that we can be used to bring people into the camp, to bring people into the fellowship, is by our works. That's why he says, let's go to Ephesians 2, 8. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is through faith. Clear, let's make it abundantly clear because someone's going to want to say, Corey is preaching a works-based salvation or backloading works into this foolishness. That's not what I'm saying. Faith is what saves you. If you place your faith in Christ today and die today, you are going to heaven. If you place your faith in Christ and you die in 30 years, you are going to heaven. The question is going to be for some, how do I even know that I'm saved? There are those who, who think they're saved and are not. There are those who even question if they're saved. There are those who are who are genuinely saved and still question it. There are those who are not saved at all 
and think they are. Well, how do you know? Well, this is why the Bible gives you tangible ways to see for yourself. I can't see if Bob or Mary or Sue are, are saved. There's no real way. I can make a guess based on what I see and what I hear, but ultimately it's not up to me. It's up to God. That's why he says, let the sheep and the goats, let them go together. He will separate the two. Let the wheat and the tear grow together. It's up to God to separate the two, not me, because if I do it, I will take some tear, claim it to be to be wheat, and some wheat thinking it's tear, and I'll get it all wrong. That's why you examine yourself. So he says, so by faith, we are saved. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So God is the one that's working in you that brings about this faith, not as a result of works so that no one can boast. So your salvation is not of works, uh, not of ergon, so that you cannot boast because of your work and what you're doing. And we don't work to boast. We don't work to say, look at me, I'm saved. Look at me, I'm more saved than you because of what I'm doing. No, we do these things because it's really what we were created for. How do I know? Because following in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Notice what he says, for good works, which he has, which God has prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Walk in what? Well, the antecedent uh, of them is these good works. These works that were prepared beforehand, these are the things that we were prepared, that we were are supposed to walk in to fulfill, to do. Why? Because again, it's how God has chosen to build his kingdom. It's how God has chosen to build the body. Us going out and preaching the gospel, us going out and seeking this, the lost, us going out and doing things for those that are in need, showing love, visiting the sick and the poor, helping the poor, uh, visiting the, the prisoners, all of those things that show us our love. If you say you don't love your brother, then you cannot, according to John, you cannot say that you love me. And so, yes, it is crystal clear that works uh, don't save us, but do works have a place in our life? Now, some are going to say, some are going to naturally wonder, well, it seems like, though, my works, my bad works seem to outnumber my good works. What then? And the Bible does kind of speak on this. And for some, they might get a little nervous when they read this passage. Uh, John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, he says, no one born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. Now you'll think, wait a second though, whatever the definition of practice is and doing that practicing of sin, I think I, I think I might qualify. I think I practice sin. What is practicing sin? Practicing sin is not just the constant doing of something where something might seem habitual. In other words, because you have a particular sin or a particular two or three sins and you might engage in that sin a number of times, which by the way, all of us engage in at least one sin a number of times. So when the day that you die on your deathbed, there's still going to be at least one, probably 30 sins that still dog you and they show up from time to time. Well, how long has that sin been happening in your life? Oh, for the last 30 years. And how many times have I committed that sin? Oh, probably about a million times. Is that the definition of practicing? It's, it seems to be habitual. It keeps showing up. Is that practicing sin? No, because practicing sin is an intentional act to keep doing. Well, wait a second, though, Corey. I do some things even intentionally. Uh, I have a, a bad habit of yelling at people, giving them a piece of my mind, and I intend to do it when I do it. Is that the same thing? Yes and no. And Paul is going to give us the understanding in just a little bit because it's clear the one that practiced sin, uh, you cannot be born of God if you are practicing sin the intentionality behind it, but it's not just you knowing you're going to do something and then doing it. Most sins that we that we are involved in, we do have some sort of forethought to it, whether it's five seconds before, five minutes before, what have you. But is that what he's speaking of? Because in this case, we're in trouble if that's the case, because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So is that speaking of us and our constant sin, the particular sin that's dogged me for 30 years? I've tried my very best. Let's say the person is addicted to something. They, they were addicted before they came to Christ, came to Christ, and they still struggle with the addiction over time. Is that person practicing sin? Is that person unsaved? No, 
Paul addresses this in chapter 7 of Romans. Paul says, well, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold in bondage to sin. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm having issues with sin. Sin has always been there. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. Notice he said, I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. I keep doing this thing that I hate, and I hate it. Well, so too does God. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. In other words, there's something else that's causing me to do this, and it's not me. There's a key there. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing is good. Let me, let me just highlight this. Because I think this is important, the willing and the word that's used here for willing, if we go over to the right, the word thaling, it comes from the Greek word thalo, which means to will, to desire, to want to. I do these things. I don't want to. do. It's not my desire. I, I, I might have this particular sin that is dogging me, but I really don't want to do this sin. I would love to get over it. And sometimes I lose out. Am I doing this every day? No. Um, but some might say, hey, it looks habitual. But for me, though, I am repentant of that. And the one thing people can't tell is how repentant you are. Well, yeah, but you can't be too repentant because you keep doing the same crime. Says who? Because they do the exact same thing, the same crime, the same sin, the same transgression, the same fall, all just as much as you do. As a matter of fact, you might find a believer who might engage in a particular sin more than a non-believer does. The issue isn't the sin that saves or the lack of sin that saves. The issue is the faith in Christ and the faith in Christ that is brought about by the Holy Spirit causes us to be torn up, to be sorrowful for that. No one can really tell you how repentant you are, you know, and God knows again, which is why Paul says, let every man examine himself. And so Paul is indicating here that the desire in him is not to do those things. I do those things, but I really don't desire to do those things. He says, for the good that I want to for the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice, there's a word again, the very evil I do not want to do. So is Paul practicing sin? No. This is why Paul is not in danger of hell. Because he says, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want to do in the word that's used for want, we do write the same word for, for desire, thalo, which is that I wish, I don't desire, uh, I don't want, this is bothersome. So he says, I do not want to, I, but what I'm doing, I'm doing the very thing I do not desire to do. My heart is not in this. Uh, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. And so here's the point. If you are a believer, are you going to sin? Sure. Your desire is not to sin. And on the flip side, what you're going to want to do is to do something that shows the faith that's in you. Now, again, there are people that will do things and not be saved. How do I know? Because Jesus made the point. He says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and all these myriad, these uh, performed all these different wonders in your name? And so the question is, does is that person saved? Well, no, because Jesus says, I never knew you. So just because you're doing these things in the word that's used here, those who perform these, these particular wonders, this, this comes from the Greek word poieo, which is to do. You're doing all these things. That's not what indicates that you're saved. You have a relationship with Christ. I never knew you. At no point in time have I ever known you. And so it's your faith that saves, but it's your work that helped to at least prove to others and sometimes to yourself that you are. Does that, is it just works though? No, because there are those here that do works and are not saved, which is why Jesus is making this point, which is why Paul makes a point to examine yourself. So here's the relationship of faith and works. Faith is what saves you. Works is what you use to indicate your salvation to also bring other people to saving faith. It's what you were created for. It's what God wants you to do. Again, going back to the beginning, what has God always been after? Our faith. And then because of our faith, what will transpire? Some sort of tangible work. How much? To what degree? Don't know. But here's what I can promise you. If you have faith, then what's going to show up more and more over time in greater detail are some works. 
If you sit and tell me that no, Corey, I can have faith and never for the next 20, 30 years show any sort of works, do anything, show no love towards anyone. As a matter of fact, I'm free to go sin how I want to go sin. I'm free and do it unrepentantly, not be bothered like Paul was or grieved by it. No, I'm matter of fact, I can walk away and uh, dilly dally in another faith. Uh, I can become a Muslim. I can renounce the faith. Uh, I can go live how I want to live. You, my friend, I'm sorry if it bothers you, but you, my friend, are not saved. And how do I know? Because, again, you show no love for the Lord. You show no love for his word and you show no love for his people. And that's why James says, can that sort of faith save you? Your desire is for yourself and you have fooled yourself into thinking that just because you may have said some words that you're saved. Again, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter just because you've done this and done that. Or you did say, Lord, Lord, that was good enough for me. I've got that taken care. I'm good to go. Let me go find the nearest party. Let me go find the easiest way to sin. Let me go find the easiest way to appease myself. You, my friend, do not love the Lord. And I'm sorry. I know there are going to be some people with some angry videos or messages. No, Corey, that's a works-based salvation. Fine. If you agree so, if you think so, you can't back it up with, you cannot refute what I just said in scripture. Not that you need to refute for me, for, just for refuting sake. But you need to make sure that you are honored, that your heart, as Jesus says, uh, their lips are with me. They say nice things, but their heart is far away. If your heart is far away from God, you are not saved. He saved you. He put his spirit in you to cause you to walk in his statutes. And you're saying that, yes, he put his spirit in me, but it doesn't cause me to walk in his statutes. I submit to you, you do not have the spirit of God. Those that have the spirit of God those that are led by, led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. Do we all, are we all led the same way? Do we all perform the same way perfectly? No, but you are still going to be following him in some way, shape, or fashion. And those that disagree, I submit to you that it's you that are preaching a different gospel, a gospel that does not change, a gospel that is not renewed a person, or made a person better in every way, shape, or fashion than prior to Christ. If you are exactly how you were prior to Christ, then I submit to you, you do not have Christ. Amen. Amen.